if anyone is determining who is on this Olympic team, it is me. It is me right now. I'm not using any excuses, anything that I've been through, anything that was currently even working against me at that meet. I was like, this is me. This is when you take it. This is like Achilles and Troy when he's pointing at the beach. It's like immortality. Take it. It's yours. You know, go work for it. And there wasn't an ego amongst all these people, all these professionals there, because they, they looked you in the eyes and they recognized someone who was willing to do whatever it took, someone who had the same grind, and someone who had those deep valleys that they got out of, someone who has been through a lot of stuff, but they always said, one more, one more, next thing. This episode is sponsored by MindSport, the number one meditation app for athletes. Today's episode features Olympic decathlete Jeremy Taiwo. Jeremy dives deep into his journey of becoming one of the best athletes in the world. He describes how he taps into his flow space, his experience at the 2016 Rio Olympics, and much more. He has some amazing stories in this one that you don't want to miss. I hope you guys enjoy. Hello and welcome to today's podcast on the Flow Station. We have a very special guest, Jeremy Taiwo here joining us today. Thank you for coming on, bro. Thank you for having me, Will. This is an awesome opportunity. I'm excited to see what we get into. Of course, man. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of Jeremy's accomplishments. He was the high school Seattle Times Prep Athlete of the Year at Newport High School. Shout out to the Knights. Go Knights. <laughs> <laughs> he was the number eight decathlon performer in NCAA history with the UW Huskies. Uh, he finished 11th in the decathlon in the 2016 Brazil Olympics. Uh, he's a current American Ninja Warrior, which I, I didn't know until I did a little bit of research, but yeah. he's also currently preparing for the 2020 Tokyo Games. Yeah. So Jeremy, great to have you on, man. Just tell me a little bit about your story, and I, I know your father was a two-time Olympian as well, uh, but what really inspired you to pursue athletics, and, and can you just explain a little bit about your journey to get to where you are today? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'll try to give the, the, short, uh, the short answer here. Um, Sports are big in my family. Um, as you can see, dad was, uh, was an Olympian, so two-time Olympian ever, ever since I was young growing up. Um, I knew that, and it was uh, constantly uh, being told to me by our family friends and family. So um, with that, I guess my expectations of athletic accomplishment and goals were set to the highest level to start with. So no matter what I pursued, I had, you know, I know what quote-unquote good is, and that's being an Olympian. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was a kid, so I was okay with that, but I did not realize setting my expectations that high was, like, made every task very daunting, <laughs> and I put a lot of just imposed pressure on myself. Um, but, no, I had a great childhood. My my parents definitely sacrificed a lot to allow me to play from club to premier soccer to getting into whatever sport, you know, t-ball to track and field eventually, and then... Um, uh, my dad was always a coach. My dad was usually my coach in soccer or track, and um, he'd been a coach at Newport High School for some years um, before I even got into high school. So uh, naturally, I felt that I had to do the sport that he was coaching. Um, it was tough uh, to let go of soccer since it's the same season here in Washington State, but I felt like destiny was calling, and uh, I felt like uh, the old man would... Uh, really get a smile on his face, which is hard to do um, should I pursue track. So that was fun. I was primarily a jumper there. Um, still playing basketball in, in the winter time before that, which I felt added a lot to it. I'm a firm believer in um, being a multi-sport athlete and multi-directional movements and every kind of thing you can do to test your athleticism. I think it just feeds into every other thing. I've learned that also through the decathlon later in life. but. Um, I would do basketball and then go into track, transition into that season. And uh, I was a jumper. Um, I love jumping high on the court, dunking. I love love the alley-oop plays we uh, eventually ran in my later (laughs) years and, uh, you know, transferred that out to the high jump. Um, That was probably my specialty, followed really closely by the triple jump. Um, uh, And, you know, kind of uh, doing the jumps in the 4 by 4 was – my main kind of uh, meat and potatoes there. But um, eventually injury is what brought me into the the other events in track and field. Um, I had a bad uh, ankle injury in, in high school um, playing basketball and um, getting out to the track, I was like, okay, time for my, my showtime kind of event. And I couldn't, I couldn't jump off the ground in the mm-hmm. high jump. I just had this 
really painful um, impingement, what I found out going on in my ankle. And uh, the doctors didn't really know what to do. I saw tons of different specialists. Eventually I was casted up and um, with that cast and also with me being team captain, I just really still want to contribute to my team. So kind of just went on crutches into the shot put ring, balanced on my right leg and kind of just started wow. doing that. Um, same with the discus, was just power throwing it and stuff. And then ended up loving them. I would uh, sometimes spend some weekends just going to the track and just throwing the discus around. It was just the most like peaceful, relaxing event I found. Mm. And um, and then eventually, yeah, by senior year, I was like, well, maybe I'll just try everything else. I'll still do the triple jumps, I'll do uh, javelin, tried the hurdles, um, and then messed around, did the pole vault at the Washington State Decathlon. And then um, the schools recruiting me early on in my sophomore year were Washington State, UW, and then Stanford. Um, and uh, I, they were like, they eventually shifted to, hey, we see you have some awesome all-around athletic potential. We'd want you to do the decathlon if you came. Would you still be interested? Mm. And I said, hey, if you're still interested in me, you know, I know my critical junior year where you get recruited, I kind of fell off because mm-hmm. of that, and a lot of schools stopped talking to you then. So the fact that they're still offering that up, I was like, yeah, I'll eat it up for sure. Mm-hmm. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Uh, so eventually I became a decathlete at Washington, and that's where I – I learned all the events, and it was it was awesome because it was through injury, which I eventually got surgery for, but um, that I discovered the other events, track and field, and then I just got uh, into the most mentally and physically demanding <laughs> event in sport I've ever done. So it's been wow, a journey. Man. So your father was a high jumper as well, right? He he did a lot of the jumps, but his main specialty was a triple jump. Okay, got you. So. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, we haven't gotten into flow yet, but yeah. uh, part of flow is autonomy, finding that intrinsic motivation and in doing what you do. For sure. Did you think, do you think those injuries really help push kind of the autonomous nature in finding your own path and finding your own, I guess, event moving forward? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest things was my dad, up until like early 2000s, was the Pac-12 record holder for oh, the wow. triple jump. He was second at, in- at nationals every time he showed up. He was the African record holder at one time. Uh, People knew who my dad was in college. (laughs) And when they started seeing Taiwo and that I was from uh, the state that he, you know, eventually ended up in, they're like, is this Joseph's son? Uh, And so there was a lot of pressure there. And uh, that was kind of one of the things that gave gave me a little hesitancy when I was looking at Washington State. I was like, man, there's some big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. Like going out winning 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 off the bat is kind of what my dad did you know he was insane so um it was great that i found the decathlon it was definitely you know in the same vein it was def- definitely a, a tough event on the body but eventually i found out that it's what the best athletes in the world do um at the olympics when you're crowned the gold medalist in the decathlon you are literally considered the best athlete in the world and you know, my dad, to me, was my athletic role model growing up. You know, he was already Olympian. He was already one of the best athletes in the world. So that, in my mind, was like, okay, this is this is it. This is how I'm going to showcase that. This is how I'm going to kind of meet where my dad meant, but mm-hmm. also not feel like I had to follow and, and kind of could go mark for mark for him. Yeah, luckily the triple jump's not on the decathlon. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's kind of where I found my fulfillment, my direction, my path, my destiny. And it was going to be representing the American team as well. Part of that pressure that you always had on you, Mm -hmm. do do you feel like as you've gone up the ranks of, you know, college to pro and now the Olympics, um, how have you been able to buffer those external pressures and, and again, been able to find your own space and your own flow and, and your own enjoyment and fulfillment along the way? That's a very complex question, but one that's, you know, it's a lot of people try to answer it. And a lot of pros will see that their strategies change over time. I remember, I was just telling someone the other day, I remember learning the pole vault. That was one event that I was terrified to do. Um, and you actually get a little bit of that fear, even learning it, or going back into it the next season that comes around. But I remember I had to get amped up. I had to think of things that made me angry, frustrated, <laughs> and just like, you know, go just for it every time I was approaching the, the vault. Um, but eventually I found that my flow turned a little bit more into, uh, being kind of more removed for it. Mm. Um, not putting this external pressure of, you know, what I've been thinking about before the meet on what I had to jump, what I had to, you know, score or mark in the PBs and just being, you know, not, not caring and just going for it. Uh, just getting into just 
feeling the presence there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is that has been going and been and and has been you know I've been on on with that feeling, but it's one of those things that I feel like you're kind of s- trying to find all the time, especially with how technical track can be. Um, a lot of people you know can become head cases, and I've I've had moments of this too with the technical events where you just are thinking so technically that you mm-hmm. your practice gets worse and worse and worse yeah. and worse, and early on that was a frustrating thing for me but I learned that uh, and because of having multiple weeks of frustration where practice was terrible but having incredible meets that that weekend preceding those or or following those I learned to just let go of the frustration know it's part of the process of really trying to break things down technically and knowing that when it does come to the adrenaline the in-game the presence of mind when the competition rolls around that those things have subconsciously been in there. So when you just try to flow with it and, you know, um, go into the events that you will actually achieve those things without really thinking of them in game moments. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's been a, that's been a cool thing to understand. And, um, when I'm training with other partners or, um, when I'm training with some of like these younger kids growing up and trying to discover that and getting frustrated with them, like, it's good to have these practices. It's good to feel like you're not doing well. This is great. This is part of it. This mm-hmm. is the part that you need to love and and learn that these days will come and go and they really teach you about how much you want to be involved with the sport, how much you care about it, and then how much you're going to be surprised when the performance comes around where you're just like, it just happened. Mm-hmm. But I think those, those 10,000 hours, they call them, yeah. right? A frustration or success and or technical you know acuity is 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 largely responsible for that performance at the end so everything so much of flow I feel like is is letting go kind of how yes. you described and not mm. not being so caught up in the technical side of it right um, and I think you did a great job explaining that those failures and those those difficulties that you experienced were the reason why you could really attain that in competition. Mm-hmm. The question that I have for you is your description of what you think flow is for you mm-hmm. and, and when you practice it, do you feel like it has now become easier to tap into it in a game? Because I feel like how I used to understand it is I thought it was, you know, this magical thing that you just tap into one time mm-hmm. when you get into a game versus, hey, am I in flow in practice? Am mm-hmm. I in flow in my training? I guess how would you describe flow for you? And then yeah. also, is that part of it really just trying to tap into your flow every single day versus yeah. just when I need it? For sure. Mm. Just like your leg muscles, quads, um, hamstrings, your mind is, is I think, the biggest the muscle, that, that organ that you're working. Um, and I think that that strengthening, that peak performance, all the, the valleys and, and the highs with how you train it, get you closer to being able to respond and get into that flow state. I think mm-hmm. it's it's definitely the mental side of it. Um, mental side of it being conditioned to understand where you are physically at the moment in time and then going right in from there. Kind of like recalling a memory. Yeah, I think, I think once you have done it, once you have tapped in, you can kind of sense it again, like, oh, it's coming on. Oh, there's another deja vu. Okay, I just need to go in and I know what my mental state was going in. Um, I, honestly, I, the biggest thing is people say, calm down, relax, and, and let things happen. I feel that the best way to get into the flow state, at least for me, is to just appreciate and really tap into that, that sense of gratitude. Mm. I think that's what takes me there. I, I think I saw one of your most recent Instagram posts. You were, you're talking about what you learned from the American Ninja Warrior, just mm-hmm. to smile, breathe, and, yeah. and just be present. Yeah. Do you feel like as you as you prepare for the 2020 Olympics, do you feel like that's going to be something, maybe a lesson, a, a little cross training lesson mentally? Do you feel yeah. like that's going to help you when you go there? Yes, absolutely, um, absolutely. I used to, I used to despise any kind of fall conditioning and and, and the building of stuff. And now I've learned just you know through all the technical volume and stuff you will be doing, just very specific to the event that the fall training is awesome. It's just like every kind of directional movement it's it's not really specific but it's just like it's not only hardening you know your muscles but your mind and mm-hmm. I've, I've learned to love that and i've learned to want that i think that um 
through a lot of injury um, that has been going on with with me in my college career and then post college career, my mind has definitely changed to this. I don't see um, an injury as another setback. I find it as another lift that my mind can do, another strengthening aspect, another like almost like bring on everything that you can, bring on all this pressure, mm-hmm. bring on all these these holes that I have to get out of because my mind is going to respond. My mind's going to have a higher and higher and a higher threshold for what it can overcome. And I just think that when you wrap yourself mount, uh, around that like <clears throat> obstacles can become those building blocks to success, you just get you just get excited when yeah. it comes up. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I feel like that's part of finding our own truth and, mm-hmm. and, and going through those challenges. We need those. Yeah, we need um, those. But I know in 2012, <clears throat> when you were at UW, you did you have to sit out the whole season for with two yes, surgeries? two surgeries. 2012, that was a tough year. That was the year that I had been looking forward to ever since I was, you know, a child watching, watching track and field because mm-hmm. I would count the years and when I think I would be ready – I didn't know what it was, but I knew my age and around the time I was going to be good enough to compete at the world level. I was like, 2012, that's it. Mm. 2012, I don't know what I'm doing, but 2012 was my first Olympic Games. And to the year prior, in 2011, win the Pac-12s, or the last Pac-10s, and have having torn my elbow, the javelin, having to have like a sports hernia, I knew that that recovery time was going to take me out of 2012. Mm. So it was a rough year. I was completely out of track completely at you know this this the weakest I've ever been yeah the skinniest I've ever been the most like away from track I've ever been and it was it was a it was a big hole to come out of for sure I know you've evolved as a person now that when you <clears throat> see those challenges it, it's you take a different posture towards it but mm-hmm. something that I've studied pretty intensively recently is the responsibilities we take in those failures and setbacks mm-hmm. in order to gr- really grow from them <clears throat> for sure how what I guess not just physical posture you take when, when you find a, a challenge or a setback, obviously you're going through some of the, the hardest training and, and challenges that you're going to see uh, in an athlete, but what mental posture are you taking as well? But also, how do you see that evolving you as a human being, not just as an athlete? That's a great question. Well, um, everything in sport, the Greeks had a saying, I've talked about this before, arete, and it's um, the well-rounded athlete, the one who, or the well-rounded person, the one who is both athletic involved in academia and then also in their community and they love the decathlon because it showed not just the sole strength of a person specializing something but how all-encompassing we can be when it comes to sport Mm. Um, and I have three things that come to mind when when asked that question one is seeing obstacles as opportunities Mm -hmm not being anxious before something is coming up but being if you're anxious that means you're you're living the future right and then um if you're depressed you're you're living in the past things that you failed to accomplish and i feel like present present is is gratitude present is you know where you wherever you are in life is being thankful for everything that you can count and everything you see as a blessing that's helped you get there um that that you have currently too yeah um and then the the second part is accountability. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had six major injuries, um, all of them at the most unfortunate times, and which you know injuries are never at great times. But I've learned that <clears throat> seeking blame outside of yourself is a waste of time. Yeah. Um, it detracts from you actually getting stronger and getting over what happened to you getting over that mentally mm-hmm. before you can actually truly let yourself heal and understand yeah. that it's, it's something that you're going to have to currently deal with and something that you will address and know how to address it in the future should you ever get close to that injury again. Um, and it kind of reminds me back to the third thing of what you see in Dr. Bob's office. Prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. And that kind of relates to that second topic I was talking about is that the more you learn about what is to come, the more you learn about taking care of your body, both you know in the gym, post practice, nutritionally, mentally. Um, that and when you tap into that prevention, the preventative care, and just being on top of things, and you know making sure you're in it when you're practicing, mm-hmm. but also taking time to be social and be be away from that as well, allowing that kind of dichotomy between your life. 
that's going to really help you just not have to do the huge drastic oh i gotta fix this now or yeah I gotta do this so really being on top of it beforehand that's a beautiful answer man i, I really like that and i'll definitely try to tap into that myself <laughs> you know you talked a little bit about dr bob mm-hmm. he's been a huge influence for me when <clears throat> when did you link with him and then if you could talk just a little bit about recovery in, yeah. in all those aspects mentally mm-hmm. physically emotionally mm-hmm. spiritually but mm-hmm. how has he sort of influenced you in that way and and, and what, what would be some words of wisdom you have for athletes that are they're overtraining or, like you said, cross-training would be a great mm-hmm. idea, but <clears throat> yeah. along those lines. Wow, great question. Um, like, like for you, I'm sure Dr. Bob is, is a mentor. He's just a fountain of knowledge. Mm-hmm. He's such a cool guy and very easily, uh, he's just so easy to relate to. Um, he came to me uh, through an interesting contact, a guy who used to run the 800 meters at Washington State while my dad was there. Turns out he's local um, basketball uh, sports and conditioning um, legend, Tim Manson. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you very much, Tim, for everything. You know, yeah. Life is a very interesting path, and you never know who you're going to meet and who's going to open doors this way and that way. So there was an injury I couldn't get over, this weird hamstring thing, and Dr. Bob was kind of my last resort um, to that. And this was like... March that I had to step away. I went to the desert with another mentor and I was like, I'm not going to get over this pain. I have the Olympic trials in four months from now. I'm not consistently training. Um, And Dr. Bob helped me with acupuncture. He helped me kind of say, oh yes, that's that's a check. That's a yes on the the need for the Eastern medicine approach. Mm. The fact that I have relied heavily on Western medicine and, and the big, like, cut, cured um, drug kind of thing that I hadn't really re- relied on on that preventative, the measure there, um, the opening of and understanding that the body is ready to heal itself if you just kind of set it in the right direction. Dr. Bob both spoke to me on that level, <clears throat> on a mental level as well. He does reiterate a lot that a lot of athletes are overtrained. Um, they're, they're, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah. Um, he is the OG in terms of when it comes to the human performing the way it does. The human knows how to do it. You just have to believe and unlock its, its natural potential. You don't need any of these other additives. You don't need to be, you know, in the gym six hours a day and really feeling like you just smoked yourself like every single day of the week. That's just not how the human body is, has meant to, is meant to adapt and get stronger. And so he definitely was such an influence on me that I brought him and another um, PT of mine who did manual physical therapy. I brought them both to Rio. Dr. Bob made me ground. Squad. It was a great squad. <laughs> I was just like, I have, <laughs> I have just these amazing influences. And um, it was cool. I felt just like I had the team. And yeah. I got there and, you know, Dr. Bob made me ground in the sand um, of, of Rio, you know, just, just the powerful, just like uh, linking into nature and then that part. And I just, you know, that stuff, it just feeds into like, you know, why we're here as humans, yeah. what we've accomplished together. Um, understanding the energy that comes from crowds and then really respecting where you are and what you're about to do and that your body and mind do actually have a conversation. You can't continually demand and demand yeah. from it. So yeah, that's how Dr. Bob has definitely helped me for sure. Talk a little bit about that experience, man. In 2016, yeah. you go to Brazil, first Olympics. Um, what insights did you gain from that challenge? And as a you know an athlete, obviously, but just what was the experience like representing the USA and and also, what did you learn as a as a human being, being around all these different cultures and people? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's a long winded answer, but um, <laughs> Rio was uh, 2016 was the most I've ever grown. I, I think I grew more in that year than all my years combined. Wow. Um, I was in- so grateful for the sponsors that I was able to secure. Um, GoFundMe was a way I was. I was. I was going to UW, training. I was coming back all the way to Renton, working at Dick's Sporting Goods in the Landing, 20 hours a week. Um, and I was just like trying to figure out how I was going to make it happen in the beginning of the fall. Uh, getting over an injury as well. Moving back away from the training center, just trying to be close to family and friends. And this really, you know, this time that was coming up. And mentally, you're just, you know, you just get nervous because it's like, this is a, this is a, 
year defining you know life moment right here you know and U.S. takes top three that day no excuses Mm -hmm. and um, that was weighing on me seeing if I did the best decision coming back and training with my coach from my last year I knew he was a great coach and I wanted to work with him but going back to where it started it made sense destiny wise I was kind of just opening my heart and mind up to that um trying to work with a sponsor outside of it. I was trying to get uh, some Nike, Adidas, or Brooks sponsorship. I had a very rough road when I went with Brooks. It was, uh, it was, I felt very othered while I was with them, and dealing with that in terms of training was another kind of mental thing that I was, I was struggling with. And Dr. Bob and a lot of my team was very supportive of it. But going to the Olympic trials, going through all the injuries, some of the doubt, some of the wonderful um, successes that I had, my life was in just like 4K high resolution that Mm -hmm. year. And the moment I remember the most was going, having a great first day, having a great first eight, nine events, and then going into the last event, and I was fourth. And the guy ahead of me, I had to beat by 13 seconds in the 1500, which is not an easy, you know, order. I have a strong 1500, but, you know, that's kind of when the mental game comes in and the presence of mind and seeing it not as a defeating thing, but something that you're going to love working towards and love just, you know, surmounting that obstacle. So when I did do that, um, I vaulted myself from fourth place into second place that I went out after that 1500 with such conviction that I was like, in my mind, I had just already set. I had the best just um, athletic growth point that I was like, if anyone is determining who is on this Olympic team, it is me. It is me right now. I'm not using any excuses, anything that I've been through, anything that was currently even working against me at that meet. I was like, this is me. This is when you take it. This is like Achilles and Troy when he's pointing at the beach. It's like immortality. Take it. It's yours. You know, go work for it. So that moment, it was amazing to me because I knew, you know, right then and there, I was on the Olympic team. I was looking at the clock. I looked at the jumbotron. I was there. I was second. Uh, a flood of just emotion and, and energy ran through me and I was just like I was just so just like blissfully grateful for everything that had happened to me everyone I had ever met everything that I had gone through everything that was supportive um, in that moment and you and it's funny because you remember all the bad stuff all the good stuff and you love it just the same that's awesome and man. so that was making the team but that was it right there so then the next couple of weeks uh Number one, don't get on antibiotics before you're about to go compete in major competition. (laughs) Stay in that, you kind of mentioned it in some of our um, notes here, that uh, youthful wonderment, Mm -hmm. that excitement. I wish I had stayed in that. I wish I had plugged in and and stayed in that blissful moment. Um, I knew I had to get back to business and train even more because I had other sponsors and other influences that weren't necessarily important to me at the time. Those weren't weren't around me when I was four years old and dreaming of this and wanting to be like my dad, right? So if anything for these athletes, stay in that beautiful, that space of creativity, creativity and just like wanting to move and accomplish lifelong things. Don't worry about the, the finite and the, the, the stuff that's immeasurable right there. It's just, it's not, it's a distraction, right? Mm-hmm. So I got into the games and, um, you know, I was with Dr. Bob with the team. And uh, fortunately I had strained my groin just a couple weeks after trials and this was like you know four or six weeks before the event so in my mind I had already come to the conclusion I was like well you know you had a big distraction you kind of let this get to you um but also my other half that's knows that knows how to battle was like guess what you're gonna jog you're gonna stay in relative condition you can't do any event stuff till you get to the games but When you get to the games, you're going to ball out Mm -hmm. because you've been given these athletic talents and you need to showcase like, yeah, you might not be able to practice before them, but boy, when it matters, you're going to perform like an athlete. And I think a lot of athletes definitely want to get there. I've already been there, checked in mentally. Like when it comes to the competition, I'm going to ball out no matter what. And so getting to the games, walking to the opening ceremony, being behind Michael Phelps, seeing all these compatriots, seeing like, you know, KD meeting him, seeing like Kyrie Irving, all these basketball players. And I'm like thinking, I'm like, man, this is incredible. But it's like, wait, I'm number two. I'm I'm the second best 
technically I'm the second best athlete America's sending. If you qualify the decathlon for, you know, athletic prowess and how it measures up, I'm like, I'm just like these guys. Yeah. It's, in, it's just like, it's humbling. And there wasn't an ego amongst all these people, all these professionals there, because they, they looked you in the eyes and they recognized someone who was willing to do whatever it took someone who had the same grind mm-hmm. and someone who had those deep valleys that they got out of someone who has been through a lot of stuff but they always said one more one more next thing and so i was just like in a in a room full of peers and it just felt it felt right mm-hmm. you know and rio being walking out in the stadium i just got back into that sense of wonderment i was like this is i'm walking in a dream right now I was so eternally grateful. I was like, I, I didn't realize how crazy it was me saying at four years old, I'm going to be an Olympian, you know, until I had to go through everything to get there, you know? Yeah. So being there at the games, it was just, it was amazing. It was just awe-inspiring. And I fought, and I fought through the whole thing, and it was an amazing competition. I, I was super proud of what I did, what I had to come through to get there and how I performed. I loved every second of it and got to see other sports done, got to see just the level of competition. I was like, wow, I was competing against arguably the best of all time, you know? So that was, yeah, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I hope I hope I can do it again and, and come back and, and really enjoy that experience again because it, oh, yeah. it was defining for sure. Well, that was awesome to hear. Thank you for sharing yeah, that, Yeah, for sure. You talked a little bit about the childlike wonderment, mm-hmm. but you also talked about the confidence, like, you know, you're seeing these people that you see on TV, but I'm right up there with them, if not a better athlete than them. Mm-hmm. Two points I guess I'd like you to hit on keeping that childlike wonderment and, and so you don't fall into the pitfalls of externals and, and those mm-hmm. pressures that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go after true enriching fulfillment instead of just all the pleasures and, and, and the things that come along the way. Yeah. But then also, I don't know, some for me that I would I'd love to hear from you is how do you move humbly towards improvement but also keep that confidence in in your star lit in terms of just like you said i'm here i'm here too there's yeah. a reason why i'm here it's not <laughs> yeah. like i gotta keep you, you know what i'm saying like you're talking exactly about you're, you're, you're scaling the mountain and you're yeah. always complexifying yourself and, yeah. and going after those challenges but mm-hmm. you also need to have that when i get into the event i'm balling out yeah for you sure. know what i'm saying for sure. and so absolutely i guess the balance of that childlike wonder and how that ties into confidence but also growth so i don't mm-hmm. know i guess that's probably three questions in one, but yeah. we'll see, we'll see yeah. what you can do with it. No, it's great. No, yeah. Um, for one, I think uh, child wonderment, uh, childlike wonderment goes with the gratitude, goes with um, being present in what you're about to com- what you're about to do, where you are currently. I feel that true athletes who are able to get into the flow state so much easier do not care how many passes they've just had, how many rebounds they just made, how many points they have, they're there to enjoy what they've been given, like God given, you know, that day, whatever it was, whatever talent they've had, they know they're there for a reason. And that's that, that they're just there to enjoy that moment because it's not going to come around. They might not ever come around again. You know, mm-hmm. some people have one Olympics game. That's, that's it. Or some people have one NBA finals. That's it. So to remove all of the ego and just stand there essentially, you know, mentally naked and just like know what you have currently right there and, and love that, appreciate it, be grateful for it. I think that's when people just perform out of their mind. Um, bro. Yeah. And uh, and if there's something with that, too, though, I feel like I don't feel people are misguided when they're cocky. I think they're on the verge of understanding what it is to be so confident or or sorry the level that they need to be confident in their abilities that they just need to express that mm. you know and some people are going to be introverts some people would be extroverts extroverts might be talking about their you know confidence on on the regular introverts confident introverts they're going to just going to know mm. you know when michael jordan you know stepped onto the basketball court he just knew he was the best person on the, he, he didn't even yeah. say it, yeah. you know? So with anyone who's, who's looking for that, that mental edge or, or, or looking to understand what, what mindset these pros are the best in the world are, you just need to know it yourself and you don't need anyone else to know it. That's what it is. And your knowledge yourself, your, your mental, you know, sharpness of being like, I am the best right now, that's going to take you way beyond what you even thought you were capable of. 
That's awesome, man. So uh, we've talked about flow. We've talked about a lot of a lot of aspects that go into it. Do you have one specific moment, maybe one meet? It doesn't even need to be the decathlon. It could be basketball. Mm-hmm. It could be mm-hmm. you know any, soccer, any sport that you yeah. grew up playing. Do you have one moment that? I guess like an origin story or something that brings you back to like this was the peak. I was in a peak experience here, and, and if you could describe, I guess for the listeners, what that felt like and what it took to be into that into that moment. Got goosebumps <laughs> right now. <laughs> I was talking to Dr. Bob about this the other day, and funny enough, um, while I was lifting weights, the song came on the ra- weight room. Okay, Rihanna. <laughs> Um, uh, what's the song name? It's I fell in love in a, in a hopeless place or something like that. Do you know that I song? have no idea what you're talking fell about. In love in a hopeless place. Okay, I've heard it. No, it's like a Let's yeah, just keep you singing it though. Kind of mel- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, this takes me back to Cabo. Okay, um, I didn't ever get a spring break until. I could literally not compete <laughs> in 2012, and I said, you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm just going to go. Yeah. A friend had invited me, and um, it was a great time. It was one where I had, you know, me- athletics were out of the window. I was just there just have fun, appreciate the beautiful just, like, you know, beach and sand and, and just, like, you know, this is what just people enjoying life is all about. And it was funny because my year back after that, Having been away from track for so long, I had a heptathlon out in Idaho. I flew out with a new coach, new couple teammates, and uh, we were doing the high jump. And I knew I had a great high jump practice. My PR before was 6'11 and a half. And um, uh, I knew that there were thoughts of, <clears throat> there was a meet going on at UW, back at UW at the same time. And I know that head coach and other people were like, we think Jeremy's looking amazingly strong. We think he's looking like he's going to set like some kind of record he, we think we might go for the american record in the heptathlon high jump i don't know and uh i knew that was going on but i got to this meet and there was like there was only like seven people competing it was so low key and they had the music playing in the background <laughs> and uh i told my coach i don't know what made me say it but i, I told him i was like a tonus this high jump i have a great feeling about it. i've already walked onto the track i'm like i'm gonna do something special here don't tell me what the height is Whenever we go up to the next bar, I don't want to know what the height is. I just want some coaching cues, but I just need to jump, you know? And the songs that I had heard in Cabo started coming on and playing while I was there. And I was just like, this is it, you know? And with that, I was just like, I'm just, I'm right where I need to be right now. Yeah. I'm enjoying every second of this. I'm having fun. I'm not miss. I'm haven't missed a bar, and I'm going over. I knew in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, the second bar cleared, third bar cleared. I think I just jumped over seven feet for the first time. That's okay. I just jumped over and never. I think I might have had the American record at one point. I'm just gonna keep going. You know, it was so fun, and people were just like freaking out, and my coach just he was just <laughs> shaking his head, just didn't know what to say. He's just like, keep doing. It. You're you're looking great, right? And uh, and then I remember I got to the last bar, and I was just like. You know, it just got super amped up. And I kind of drifted out of the flow a little bit. And I was just like really wanted to make it happen. I was trying to tap extra into the flow. I think I was doing a little more a little more Jedi forcefulness <laughs> than, I, than I thought I was equipped to do. But um, I missed my last attempt at the bar. And I, <clears throat> I look over and she was like, um, do you know what you got out at? I was like, no, I was just, I was just here to jump. She said, uh, you were attempting seven five and three quarters. You were attempting like 228 in the high jump. My PR before that was like I don't know, 211, so 611. And wow. I was like, whoa, really? And so I was like, so what did I jump? She's like, you jumped seven, four and a half. I had a five inch PR. And she's like, that's the uh, heptathlon world record in the high jump right now. Wow. I was like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> and it was just so, it was just so like, I don't know. It was just like. It shattered my athletic like, belief. like you know what you 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 know you're capable of something and you always aspire to do something. But like, when it just happens, mm-hmm. when you're just like, they're not trying to force it to have fun. It just totally reshapes how you approach sport and what you think about it. Yeah, that was that moment right there. And uh, you know, I was just it was so cool. Went on to have a, you know the rest of a great meet and uh, 
I, that was just the most crazy moment I've had in sports. Why would you Why you tell them not to tell you the the height? Were you just not trying to put a cap on what you felt like yes. you could do consciously? Yes, yes. Dr. Bob and I talked about limiters, mm. and uh, with that. A lot of athletes who do the high jump will talk about once the bar goes to seven feet, everything about their form, approach, mental, you know, attack just just changes. Yeah. You know, because they're like, oh, this is this is like going under, you know, four minutes for the mile. This is like, you know, not ever supposed to be done. So mm. um, I decide to get rid of the limiters. Like, if there's no one who can put limits on me, I already have limitless beliefs in what I can achieve. Why should I also let some inanimate thing determine what I can, you know, accomplish? That's kind of what it what it's been. Cool. I think everyone needs to adopt that as well. Like, yeah. you may have, you know, it's that moment from Pursuit of Happiness when Will Smith's talking mm. to his kid. Do not even let me tell you what you can and cannot do. Um, I think positive encouragement, positive self-encouragement, never putting limits on anything. It's a very, what people would say, unrealistic way to approach things are, but... You know, like they say, you shoot for the moon, you miss, you land on the clouds, you're in the stars. So it's just, it's it's easy. Just don't don't limit yourself in any way. Yeah, man. You know Tyler Harvey, right? Uh, Basketball player. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he was talking about something similar, uh, not about not putting a cap on, you know, if he had a goal of a scoring average and then he got it, let's say, in the first half, like, are you yeah. done there? Yeah, or are you right. just going to keep going? Yeah. I think I've experienced that quite a few times in, sure. in my games, just... Yeah. You know, not putting a cap on on what I can do yeah. in, in that way, but that's that's a very cool way of, of thinking about it um, yeah. for sure. I, I was I was in Bob's office yesterday, and mm-hmm. and I saw you guys were flowing on dopamine and serotonin, yeah, and, and, yeah. and the differences of those two. If you could give, especially the younger generation athletes, I know, at least for me, I grew up with social media. I mm-hmm. was probably the first wave, first generation that had it going on when I was in the de- developmental stages. Do you have some insights on that? I guess that you could share from the flow you had with Bob and, yeah, and for sure. you can take that any way you want. Yeah, just the difference between the two and, and yeah. why you believe it's important. Yeah, um, with Dr. Bob, I think it's just been just this crazy amount of momentum of doing everything holistically and how to help your health. So first and foremost, I on my um, Apple device, I turn like the brightness as low as it can be. I turn like true tone off. I have it very like non-invasive for your eyes because you know you're on your phone quite a bit. You do discover that, um, and I also actually got a blue light blocker um, kind of screen protector. It's a dual function thing. You can get it on Amazon for like I don't know like 12, 13 bucks. So I do recommend something like that. Looking into more of that, I do put my phone on airplane mode quite a bit. There's been studies to show people having it on specific pockets if they don't alternate, your hip bones mm. can weaken. There's there is radiation coming off your your phone from the battery from its connection to cell tower, especially if you do have Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi things on all the time. So those some those some hazards I like to share that a lot of the public doesn't really like. I mean, some people whisper about it, but those are serious things that we haven't really divulge a lot of like long-term effects for people so yeah kids be careful just how much you're on your phones um try to have like limited screen time use them when they're necessary on the social media side that's a that's definitely something i haven't really grown up with um it did come up uh relatively a good amount when i was in college um and the thing is with that is there's a constant comparison with other people and everybody needs to know that they're their unique mm-hmm. individual self. And as much as we aspire to be or aspire to understand what these people have accomplished or where they're at in life, we have no idea how they got there. And we don't know whether it's them, you know, in the off hours behind social media, grinding, grinding, or finding uh, having just been presented with just one off random lotto opportunity that they just said, oh, yeah, I'll go with that. And that's where they are there, you know. So unless you're using that as a source of motivation, seeing I love the success stories like Goggins uh, mm-hmm. is, is an amazing person. He has a great podcast on the Joe Rogan podcast. But unless you're using those measurements of seeing how s- successful in your eyes a person is getting and, and understanding each step or just getting a relatively in-depth idea of how what it took to get there don't compare yourself to others don't measure your success with where you're at now with where they are where you ought to be in a certain amount of years 
success, much like puberty, much like the growth of an individual's body and mind comes in different stages for everyone, for everyone's, you know, life and time frame. People don't know what they want to do even when they're 60 years old, but then they find it around the corner the next year and they're just like, I understand why it took so long for me to get here and I'm glad I discovered this now rather than even in my 40s when people would consider me a full-fledged adult. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use other people's things, uh, uh, measurements of success, at least go and do your research, do your tabloid digging, understand what it took for them to get there, what they say about personally about what success means to them, um, or just don't even look at it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's kind of... It, it, there's there are distractions and if, if you could um, trade that kind of uh, I don't want to say f fanaticism because I think it's important to have to be a fan of someone especially if you, especially if you like the way they think emulate things if you could trade that for learning how to improve on yourself or knowledge that you think is relevant to what you want to do or what you're trying to accomplish it's easy to pick up a book or it's easy mm -hmm. to kind of look up something on, on Wiki or, or look up something on, you know, Google Docs. So think about changing some of that time and, and allocating it to how you can work on yourself. That's a that's a fun thing I like to do. Yeah, that's a good Social answer, bro. Media. Yeah, for me, I've, I've taken a lot of breaks off of it. I try to put myself consciously in that space. If I go on, it's not to compare at all, but it's to either learn or just connect with someone. Yeah, to actually sure. connect, not yeah. to judge it or Absolutely. or anything like that. And so that's Absolutely. kind of the space I took mm -hmm. with it. But also part of flow, you know, is being very attentive. Like you have to have your full attention in something. Mm -hmm. I think that's also another issue with social media is the dopamine yeah. that you get. You feel like you need to be on it, but mm -hmm. it's it's harder, I guess, to do something like read a book yeah. when you, you always feel like you need to be on your phone. Yeah. Dr. Bob definitely talked about how you do find that addiction, right? And it's it's not it's not a natural thing to want to go back to your phone because it's actually releasing that those those hormones that don't means like, oh, this is something that's good. That's why you keep coming back to it, feeding it. We talked about the flip side of that, serotonin, the group belonging, mm. that dynamic. That is where I need people to understand. I know it might be hard for people to be social, but we are social beings. There's a reason why teammates are so close in team sports. Like there needs to be obviously pressure and work and suffering together that needs to happen in sport, but there also needs to be the laid back time, the getting to know people, the fun, you know, that, that's how we've evolved. That's actually where we release a lot of our recovery hormones for people that don't mm. know that. Then when you step away from, you know, exerting effort and we're around our close people that we care about and love one, that's when a lot of mental and physical recovery does happen. Um, so with that, anytime I can get around friends to just be be with them, mm. you know, be focused on them. Not I don't need my phone. If I'm if I'm with the people that really, you know, make my day or really I enjoy being around, I I couldn't I could not look at my phone for hours. I put that on airplane mode. It's like this is why I'm here. Mm. So if you can, I challenge you to do that. And I challenge you to find the people that want to put want you to put your phone away. You know, and yeah. um, anytime you can you can choose to be in a group setting where you're just kind of kicking it before you you know need to go to practice or do that. Like really enjoy being in that present moment. Um, I do also suggest if you can, anytime there's a little bit of a, a route where you need to go somewhere and it's in nature, appreciate being in nature in that moment. A lot of us do walk and we're on our phones quite a bit when we're going here to there. I know it helps the time go by fast, but we live in a beautiful place. Um, and I feel that nature is also one of those things that really just shows how, how grateful we have it. You yeah. know, it's, it's an amazing world we live in for sure. That's awesome, man. The last question I'd want to ask you, and you can finish off with one, anything mm -hmm. you want to share or, or say to end it, but what do you, what do you feel like your purpose is uh, on this earth and being an athlete who has influence in, in, on a world scale, how do you see that as part of that mission and that, and that purpose? Yeah. Um, reading that question, when you sent it to me, I was like, wow, that's a deep one. Uh, I might not even know what my purpose is, but um, definitely as an athlete, and I love to thank everyone who has been <clears throat> who has inspired me and who has been inspired by me, mm. that when we are in those wonderful moments of sport, I'm hoping that when I'm doing my event, at least, I'm giving you know, the next generation or the next person that's looking up a sense of that wonder and excitement 
because I hope that that's the state that I'm in when I'm mm. doing it. I really hope that what I can accomplish athletically or what I have breaks down barriers or breaks down people's um, ideas of setting limits for what the human can do. Mm. I want people to live in a co- and pursue things with without expectations, with just you know, no, no, no limitations whatsoever. I think that's that's definitely my purpose athletically and and in life. Hopefully, with friends and you know what I eventually do career wise, I hope I do um, allow people to really open their minds, become present, become grateful for what they have. Not necessarily see the long, responsible way to do something as something that's daunting and a task and not what we should do, but what we ought to do yeah. and what we really have to approach everything that we do in life because things definitely have ramifications and, you know, I'm a, I'm a big person in, in, under, in the little things that contribute to the overall wellness and happiness of everybody else on the planet. I think you really have to tap into that. When you live your life. That's awesome, man. Thank you for all the wisdom. Absolutely. And appreciate you coming in. And then we got the $10 shot outside. Ooh. I don't know if you're ready. <laughs> okay, it's been Get a minute. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, thank you, brother. I yeah, really appreciate you. it. And no, I, I learned awesome. a lot just from listening to you. And uh, I look forward to editing it up and Absolutely. putting it out there. All right. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. been awesome. Right. The second $10 shot, Jeremy Tywo. Oh, man, did Mike hit this on the first try? Yeah, uh, he airballed it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no expectations. Here we go. <laughs> He's pulling up from deep. Oh! Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. I wanted to give another quick shout out to my sponsor, MindSport. MindSport is a meditation app made specifically for athletes. If you want to improve your performance on and off the court, lower your stress levels, learn the foundations of meditation and yoga, and improve your quality of sleep, this app is for you. Make sure to give it a download in the iTunes App Store, and we'll see you in the next video.